Welcome to Monster Chats, presented by Monster VoIP, where we share the tools, methods, and best practices that business leaders use to build new connections, strengthen relationships, and impact sales and organizations of all shapes and sizes. If you have any questions that come up during today's episode, please text them to 424-378-6966. Please welcome the founder of Monster VoIP, your host, Colin Mitchell. On today's episode, we're going to be talking with John Warner. John and I are going to be talking about entrepreneurship, healthcare innovation, and aging-focused technology. I'm Colin Mitchell, the host of Monster Chats and the founder of Monster VoIP. John Warner is a mentor, board advisor, author, CEO, educator, and startup angel investor in healthcare, aging, longevity, and other sectors. John, welcome to Monster Chats. How are you doing? I'm doing well, Colin. Thanks. Great to be here. Yeah, thanks so much for hopping on here. Um, you know, you're very well accomplished. Um, and I just want to really dig into your story and kind of, you know, where you grew up, where it all started, and then we'll kind of take it from there. Sounds good. Well, I, I was born in uh, the UK uh, a lot of years ago now um, in the middle of England, uh, about as far from the ocean as I could get. Spent my first 29 years uh, in that country had an early career in uh, corporate life, uh, enjoyed all of that, uh, ended up with ExxonMobil. Uh, it's a very big corporation. Uh, they took me to Australia uh, with a corporate job out there, but that was the end of my corporate interest. I found the country I wanted to be in for a while, but I didn't much enjoy corporate life. Uh, I thought I was waiting for dead men's shoes. Um, So that was the beginning of my journey to get out. I got out into consulting work, which is independent. I formed my own consulting company early on. My very first clients were in healthcare, weirdly. Um, I worked with uh, pharma companies and biotech companies and then large hospital systems um, because I was working on the business side and I knew something about business. I didn't know much about health back then, but I, I knew a fair bit about Uh, how to be efficient and effective. Um, So I spent a fair bit of time in the Australian healthcare system getting to know it. Uh, That got me into then understanding back to the UK healthcare system. I got a lot of work there. And before I knew it, I was getting clients in the US. Uh, So to cut a long story short, 16 years ago, I ended up um, leaving Australia and coming to live in California um, and doing what I do um, in terms of uh, the US marketplace. Uh, And for the most part, that's been entrepreneurial life. I've worked my way from large uh, entities in healthcare down to startup and early stage companies who are trying to disrupt healthcare. And then along the way, I've had three startups of my own. Um, So uh, I don't just do advisory work. I have jumped in. And as I like to say, I'm I'm batting one for three. And I don't want to pretend that I'm any more successful than that. I had a spectacular failure, lost a ton of money. I had one where I got out by the skin of my teeth. I kind of, you know, invested about the same amount as I got back, which is not exactly a great result. And even my good exit, I made money for shareholders. We got about a two and a half exit, but I don't think I I can claim it was a great success. But, uh, you know, at least I can say we we sold out and, uh, and, and got a return for our investors. So that's the that's the short story. Mm, Okay. so tell me when you're on living in Australia. How did you start to, you know, land some some U.S. clients? What happened there? What um, what attracted those clients to start working with you? Yeah, I think it's an expertise thing as much as anything. I think uh, those organizations, in some cases, had ambitions to get beyond Australian shores. If you know, Australia is one of those strange places that's miles from anywhere, and the market is relatively small. So if you've got ambitions to make more money, you really need to get beyond that. So Australians will very routinely push out into Asia in particular. Um, But because uh, even those marketplaces aren't necessarily English speaking, a more common route is to go to other English speaking marketplaces. Um, So for example, not so much in healthcare, but if you go and take banking technology, people don't know this, but in the US, most of our banking technology is Australian. If you think about secure vault technology and you think about the way our switching systems work on payment rails, a lot of it is Australian technology uh, that gets adopted. It's because the Australians have pushed into this market entrepreneurially and they've done it in many other industries and healthcare is one of them. So there's a very healthy uh, pipeline 
so that got me introduced to a number of US clients that I started working with and for from a distance initially. And that gave me a soft landing when I, uh, I started to work here. Uh, in fact, I also had a marriage change just to be personal. So uh, I divorced from my first wife, met a California girl. And those two uh, happy accidents uh, work out here. And uh, mm -hmm. you know, a, a woman that I could be with uh, got me to relocate here in uh, 2004. There's always a woman involved there when, there's, always when, a there's, woman. A, when there's a major relocation uh, as true. part of That's the right. story. It's not all work, <laughs> exactly. There's always got to be some other driver. Uh, all right. So tell me, how what was that transition like, you know, being born in the UK, working in the Australian market, and then coming to the US. Was there any yeah, challenges around actually. that? actually. Yeah. And, and you know, I'd, I'd always thought the American healthcare system was, parts of it at least, were very sophisticated. And I expected to see a lot of innovation, a lot of technology that I'd not seen before. Um, but not so much once I got on the inside. Um, and it's largely because it's, it's gigantic. Um, it's big, it's fragmented, um, there's a federal system and there's obviously a state-based system. They don't always talk to each other well. So I think my first surprise was just how fragmented um, and, and poorly it communicated. So I think that was a shock uh, to me just in terms of coming into it because I think in some ways I had to go back to basics in terms of uh, where to make interventions. And technology has to play that way. You can't just innovate if the base system you're dealing with needs work. So I think for me, it was it was a bit of a wake up call that um, you know a lot of what we were doing, for example, in the the Australian system, wasn't possible in the U.S. system. Mm. Um, we just couldn't go as fast. As simple as that. Wow. Okay. So there was a lot of challenges that took uh, getting used to um, in in the U.S. market versus working in the Australian market. Yes, very much so. And, and it's not so much there weren't entrepreneurs thinking about change, but I think starting from further back. So mm -hmm. basic changes. So if you think, for example, in health um, about, say, EMR systems, I mean, really EMR systems have been, were in the rest of the world a lot earlier than they were in the, in the U.S., so the electronic health record or the electronic medical record had, had been well established. We had a lot of pushback in terms of introducing it. Um, and in fact, it took uh, government legislation to actually give people grant incentives to turbocharge that system. And it took us a decade, a decade longer than everyone else to go and get people even onto a basic electronic record. So today we think if we visit a doctor, well, yeah, at least we've retired the clipboard, but not so much. There are certainly specialists who are still gonna give you that clipboard with a pencil or a pen. Um, in some specialist areas, even today, and this is 20 years later. So mm -hmm. it's a good example of how slow we are as a system to adopt really basic technology. Um, and that's true across the system. You would think something like that should be more mandatory, right? Yes. Just and, and you know, we, I guess we always believe in the First Amendment in this country. You know, our freedoms are due with what we like, uh, and that includes not uh, getting too far into the future. So... Uh, we tend to go and maintain legacy systems rather than set mandate that they've got to disappear. Uh, so we just layer on top. Uh, so we've left old systems in place while the new comes in, you know, along. Uh, by and large, we've got high penetration now, but it's a baby step. And that's mm -hmm. the problem in healthcare. You know, you want to push further and faster. And that's often the frustration, how fast you can go. Mm. So, okay. So tell me now from working with a lot of large, you know, corporations, specifically in healthcare, when did you start to transition to work with more startups um, and kind of venture out of that industry and why? Yeah. So, so two answers to that. I, I said I had some startups on my own. And I, you know, when you've been in corporate life, you think you're ready to go and start your own business or spin up a startup and even raise capital. And you're not. <laughs> I, I call it being hidebound. So you have to learn new tricks and there's no better way to jump in yourself. And I enjoyed those journeys. Um, but as I said, batting one for three, I didn't think I was necessarily the best person to be in a startup. But I thought I could learn from it, and I thought I could uh, advise um, having been on the inside. And then particularly, I'd say, when I came to the U.S., uh, the, the U.S. definitely has a more entrepreneurial spirit. 
Um, so it, it was a, there was a lot of startups out there who were trying to go and change the system. So it wasn't uh, difficult finding uh, individuals who wanted to do something uh, and to offer help to them. So that really started in earnest when I came to the US, um, you know, in 2004 and beyond. Um, and I found the smaller the company became, I, I was working with companies that had had institutional capital, but I, I actually found I worked, I, I found it better when I was working with companies who'd either just been angel backed or were bootstrapped or were uh, either just this side or the other side of an A round. Uh, partly because at that point, they're a little bit more malleable, they're a little bit more open to inputs. And I think I enjoyed steering them towards product market fit um, in the early stages. Because if you work with a later stage company, if the product market fit is poorly established, really the whole startup's on a bed of sand. Mm. And that became frustrating because you're pushing down a path that probably isn't going to go very far. You know, the curve may be too flat and it's very hard to steepen in it. Uh, so it, increasingly, I've actually gone more downstream, I would call it, to smaller mm. entities in terms of where I've applied my time and attention. And is that because it sounds like basically they're more coachable, um, more yeah. open to feedback, uh, and maybe you could make a bigger impact. Yes, very much so. I mean, there's always the recalcitrant, the uncoachable individual, even in a small startup. Mm -hmm. But yes, by and large, I think more open to input and steering because they haven't got the product market fit yet. So, you know, at least you've got that openness of mind. Um, and that's, that's inherently healthy, um, you know, I think. And I think the other thing is that they're more open to... Uh, listen not just to people like me, but to their peers, mm. uh, because I think they're watching competition much more aggressively than uh, at later stages when there's almost blinders get on companies as they get a little bit further down the track and they think they're, they're on a single path and they forget to watch the competition. I think that's crucial in any entrepreneurial journey is, is to go pay attention all the time to what others are doing around you. Mm, okay. And so would you say you predominantly work with, you know, startup, um, startups now, or do you still have a combination of larger corporation and startup as well that you, you work with? Yeah. So, um, so I, I run, I'm CEO of a, of a company that I founded called Silver Moonshots and Silver Moonshots has got two activities. So one of them is research and I've become particularly passionate with the older adult community uh, the 50 plus marketplace, partly because we spend 80% of our healthcare dollars in the 50 plus marketplace, uh, fairly inevitably, uh, because it's where we have chronic conditions. Um, and a lot of our expenses are therefore consumed in that space. Um, and I, I think it's important not to treat that whole marketplace as a monolith, um, as if it's undifferentiated. The 50 plus market in the US is 120 million people, and you can't have a one size fit all for 120 million people. So we tend to get paid to do research work to find tribes within that population by larger corporations. Mm -hmm. so there's one revenue stream that comes from that, and I work on that side. But 90% of my work uh, on the other side of the fence is with smaller startups. Uh, so we run a virtual accelerator. Um, so every quarter we invite in half a dozen companies um, that are focused on the older adult community in some way, shape, or form. Uh, so right there, uh, there's a lot of interaction that I take. It certainly dominates my time. And some of them are for profit. Some of them are more social impact orientated or even nonprofit. Um, and then in addition to that, I manage the deal flow into a fund in LA on the healthcare side. So I probably see about 300 decks a year from new startups uh, that are looking to disrupt healthcare in one, one, one way, shape or form. Wow. 300 decks a year. That's quite, that's quite a lot. So uh, is there any that you're like really excited about that you're either currently working with or that you've seen that are maybe you're getting ready to possibly work with? Yeah, I, I, I get excited by a lot of companies. I, I, I think it's hard not to get excited yeah. at the ideation level with, uh, we have a bit of a vetting process. So I don't want to kind of, you know, favor one over the other because I think they wouldn't be in the, in a cohort of even six unless I was interested in what they're doing. Uh, I don't think the challenge though is in ideation. I think we've got great ideas here, um, many of them. As you know, Colin, it's, it's the execution path that matters. 
uh, and that's a much tougher game. So I'm I'm often excited by the idea, but I I watch really carefully, cautiously, and some might say skeptically, about whether the path is is uh, is executable. Um, and that's a whole different challenge. And that's what we try and help with. Uh, and it's where I kind of apply my efforts uh, entrepreneurially to try and give people a rubric uh, for how they might ask questions. You know, there's no cookie cutter formula, but I think you can ask good questions. Um, and my obsession is really digging into customer discovery. I'm not the first to say it. You know, this is Steve Blank from Stanford, uh, kind of, you know, really got people thinking about this probably 15 years ago now, but it is so crucial to every entrepreneur to, you know, go deep in the uh, discovery of who, you know, they're trying to serve with mm -hmm. whatever they're trying to solve. That's where execution can really work if you've done that well. So a lot of times are you betting on the, the jockey and not the horse? So that's an interesting question. I think in early stage companies, it's all about the jockey because uh, I think putting your team together and it's jockeys plural because it's good founder, but a single founder rarely makes it. So it's finding a good co-founder or a couple of co-founders. And I think you've got to choose well. So I think that's all about being self-aware, you know, that whole Socrates line, know thyself. Um, be self-aware and then be aware enough that you want individuals around you that have got a growth mindset. So we're yeah. back to your point again about listening, being open, being coachable, being wrong. Mm -hmm. And that's a growth mindset, right? So I, I, I think it's crucial in the early stages. I think once you get past an A round, the game changes. And I've certainly got friends in the investment community who says, I don't care at all about the jockey by the time I'm at a B round because I want the metrics to be working. And in the end, I can switch out the management team. And indeed that happens, right? Mm -hmm. Very few CEOs survive multiple rounds of capital or indeed a founder team. Um, they're just not ready for that journey. Uh, so I think it matters like crazy at the beginning, it matters less at the further you go. Got it, yeah. And so out of the 300 decks that you see, uh, uh, you know, on a yearly basis, how many of those make it to your accelerator, accelerator program? So some come into the accelerator because that's an angel um, accelerator. And how many make it into the executive committee of the fund? Um, uh, it's probably 5%. Uh, so it's pretty small. The rejection rate is pretty high and it's, it's timing, right? Um, it's not because I don't like more than that. I often do, but sometimes they just haven't done the work or they are in a red ocean of competitive space. And I think, well, wait a minute, not another IOT device or an AI play that 27 other people have done in market and are trying to do things with. And you can sometimes just ask the question, you know, do you know your competitor? I had a guy on the phone yesterday with a, with a, a watch, which was for fall detection. Fall detection is a massive problem in the older adult community. Uh, there's a lot of savings to be made, but he must be about the sixth watch I've seen in the last three years. Mm -hmm. um, so the first question is what's special about it? What's different? And if you can't answer that, you need to go back and do the work again. Go dive deeper. Go find out. You can't just say I've got an accelerometer on my on my in, in my watch that will detect a, a fall of two feet or more. It's not enough. Everyone else is doing that too. That's just a me too product. Mm, yeah, and you probably see a lot of those. I see an awful lot of that, and that's why the the dropout rate in terms of what they're doing is low because. I, very often this happens in healthcare and it particularly happens in aging care. Um, and it could be a younger entrepreneur, you know, mom or dad has had a problem or grandma or grandpa have had a problem and they think, Oh, I can solve for that. And, and they do. And they might even go tinkering. They might even build an MVP, <laughs> but what they haven't done, that might take them a year to do. And by the time they're talking to me, they say, I think I've got something really great. Look, look. Mm -hmm. And, you know, unfortunately, my skepticism says, well, yeah, but, you know, why don't you just go out and talk to a whole bunch of people first um, before you built anything and save that $250,000 of, you know, your friends and family money you just spent? Because, mm -hmm. you know, you really have to stand out in, a, again, that red ocean. That's tough. Mm -hmm. I wish people would do less of that. You know, customer discovery is so simple. Even if you have to do it via Zoom, as you and I are right now, I know in a COVID world, it's really hard to get out there and get face to face, but you can do this. 
and you can ask non-leading questions of people um, mm. to go and figure out, you know, how, how they perceive things. Oh, yeah. And there's so many ways to collect feedback and find the right people before, you know, going down that path of, like you said, you know, building the MVP without getting, getting exactly. any feedback. Exactly. And doing it in a listening centered way, again, without getting too white knuckled about this, there's a huge difference between market research and customer discovery. You know, market research is doing focus groups and, you know, using, you know, MailChimp or whatever it is and asking a bunch of questions. The trouble with that is that's necessary, but later. Uh, often then you're leading the witness, you know, you're holding up a product, you know, look, I've got this cup and, you know, what do you think of it, Colin? And you say, mm-hmm. well, I hate blue. If it was in red, I might like it. Well, that's fine. But the trouble is I've constrained you to thinking about what I'm holding up in front of the camera right now. In discovery, you don't even want to talk about what your is in your head. Don't even mention it. Just say, I just want to know what it's like to be you and tell me about how you consume liquid, for example. I'm not even talking about a cup. And you might tell me, uh, you know, I, I drink through a straw all day long. Um, in which case, what's the point of talking to you about a cup? So I think if people could learn that really early, I think they'd save themselves a huge amount of grief down the road. Mm, yeah, no, that's interesting. How does somebody go about getting to the right people to get that sort of feedback before going down that path? So, so I, I think that's about really digging in to who's got the deepest pain in the customer set you're looking at. So again, we can't boil the ocean. You'd have had plenty of people on the show, I'm sure, telling you this entrepreneurially. You know, I've got this great product. I, and again, I'll use the cup. You know, look, a cup, everyone has to drink, right? So what's my market? My market is seven and a half billion people on the planet. Well, that's never true. It's never true. And then not only is it not true, it's not even true at a micro level. Uh, you've really got to kind of skinny that down and it's kind of counterintuitive, right? The narrower your beachhead market, the more successful you're likely to be because you can dominate that. Mm -hmm. So I think it's all about getting down to a really narrow customer persona um, by research initially. Um, And and if that's a thousand people who live in your neighborhood, well, so be it. And you know exactly who they are. They tend female. They tend to be between 40 and 50. They tend to have this much money. You know, whatever it is that defines the persona and then talking to them and only them and just making sure you validated whatever hypothesis you've got. You know, people really like blue cups with little handles on them. Okay. Um, Then I think you've got something. And, you know, when people say, I I know people laugh at this. I, I, you know, I, I watch kind of, you know, strange programs, which are more familiar than anything else, like Shark's Tank. What are they doing when they're listening to pitches? They're listening to see whether there's a really narrow data set that they can extrapolate from. So can I find a thousand customers that like what you're doing, even if they live within a mile of your house? And then can you go and get 10% of them to say yes and buy whatever it is you're selling? If you can, I can extrapolate from that. That is way more important than anything else you could do. I don't need to know you've got a 10 million person market on, you know, that you can reach. I need to know you can get 10% of that thousand people to say yes to whatever it is because you've, you've validated the pain that you're solving for or the gain you're looking to give them. Um, so as you can tell, I get white knuckled about this. This is where discovery is just so important. It's just such a, a critical thing to establish from the get-go. How many people do you see skipping that step? A ton, a ton. The majority? Uh, yeah, 95%. And I think that it's two things. It's either I didn't do it at all uh, because, you know, I just talked to my friends. My friends tell me they like me, right? There's a book out there called The Mom Test. And The Mom Test is called that because I go to mom and say, hey, mom, what do you think of this? What's mom going to tell you? Your mom loves you. She's going to say, wow, Colin, what a great idea. You're such a great guy. I've always yeah. liked you. You know, anything you do, you'll be great in life. That's mm. pretty worthless, you know, not nice if you want to get validation from mom, but not as customer feedback. All the sample sizes are too small or not even the beachhead market. So I've randomly talked to a bunch of people and they're not even my beachhead. So even big companies don't do this well. Uh, so you see companies that even get on the radar, get a fair way. They might even get a couple of rounds of capital, but actually product market fit isn't quite there and they become a one trick pony. Mm-hmm. 
Wow. That is pretty, that's a big number. 95% of companies that you see are, are skipping this crucial step. Yeah. Skipping or under undervaluing it, not doing enough of it. So, you know, Blank says early on, if you're a C-stage company, you know, do a hundred interviews with your uh, beachhead market only, just your beachhead. Now, if you're B2B, that's a tough ass. Let's say you're selling to commercial healthcare payers. There's only 200 of them in the country and you've got to go and talk to 100 of them. That's 50% of them. Now, you know, maybe that's not top to bottom, but there'll be a persona within that. Who is the person who's on the buy side in a commercial payer that you can talk to? That might take you a while. So I think what a lot of people do is think, oh, that's so tough and it'll take so long, but it's crucial because if you don't do it and that's your major market to sell to, um, you know, you're going you're gonna to flame out. Uh, capital just isn't patient enough to be around while you skip that step and learn it later. You've burnt too much money and you're burning other people's money. Mm, yeah. And you might get the feedback that says this is not a great idea. And more often than not, that's the case. You, and, and in fact, I, I, I think in customer discovery, it's the oblique throwaway comments where the gold lies. You know, it's that old phrase, uh, the riches are in the niches, right? Well, at least if you say it with an English accent, if you're an American, you have to call it niches and try and make it rhyme. But, um, but, but anyway, um, that's where you can kind of drive into a space and do something amazing very often. And it's listening hard because your core hypothesis might be half right, but it's mm. that mini pivot that gets you suddenly on track. You know, it's kind of the YouTube story. It, it wasn't a dating site. It was a cat video site that got them to an 18 month uh, path to exit to, to Google ultimately. Wow. Uh, well, John, thanks so much for coming on the show today. Uh, we're going to take a quick commercial just to tell you what we do here at Monster Voip. Uh, we started Monster Void, frankly, because we we're sick and tired of getting gouged on our business phone bill and getting dropped calls. Today, we serve over 6,000 customers. We're passionate about saving businesses money and giving them the features that they need in a modern tech stack for today's companies. You can text info to 424-378-6966 to learn more. Uh, John, we've talked about a lot of incredible uh, things. And I think one of the main takeaways is, is collecting that customer feedback and how crucial that step is um, and how many companies actually skip that step is, is beyond me. Um, so before I let you go, is there anything else you want to let people know? Where can they find you online? Where can they find out more about the things that you're passionate about and that you're working on? Sure, sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm everywhere um, online. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm John Warner without an H, J-O-N. That's how you'll find me. I'm John C. Warner on Twitter. I'm on Facebook. Um, the website to go to if you want to kind of look at my uh, philosophy and methodology is called slamprocess.com. S-L-A-M. I wrote a book last year called The Startup Launch Assistance Map which was my general rubric of questions that every startup needs to ask themselves on that journey to product market fit. There's a whole bunch of free stuff on that website, including the map itself. Go take a look. Step one is figure out the unmet need and do customer discovery. So you'll get a lot more information there and happy to talk to anyone. Awesome. And where can, where can they find the book? Uh, the book's everywhere. It's on Amazon, Barnes & Noble. It's a physical as well as an ebook. Um, so, and if you go to slamprocess.com, uh, you'll find uh, there's links to it right there. Um, you'll get a lot even without buying the book. And by the way, it's 144 pages long. I kept it nice and short with a case study in it just to go and illustrate some of the points. So it's an easy read. Awesome. John, thank you so much for coming on the show today. If you're listening to the podcast, please subscribe, share with your friends, and we're listening for your feedback. The show is all about you. Thank you for tuning in for another episode of Monster Chats, presented by Monster Voip, where we share the tools, methods, and best practices that business leaders use to build new connections, strengthen relationships, and impact sales in organizations of all shapes and sizes. If you have any questions from today's show and want to reach us directly, 
Please text your question to 424-378-6966.